If you haven't noticed, uh, different churches do things differently. That may be a surprise to you. I'm going to come back down here. I forgot to bring this with me. My cheat sheet. Different churches do things differently. And I think sometimes if we just kind of accept that, maybe we wouldn't have so many arguments about how we do church. Every church has liturgy. Some of it's printed in the bulletin and some of it's not. (laughs) The Bible actually doesn't have a whole lot to say about how we do this. It, It has a good bit to say, though, about our attitude when we do this. The things that cause us problems are usually human problems. And keep in mind that the New Testament, in its entirety, is written to believers. The Old Testament, for the most part, in its entirety, was written to believers in the one true God. We got something on this side of Calvary and Pentecost that they didn't have on the other side of Calvary and Pentecost, and that's the Holy Spirit indwelling all believers. That, that, that element that changes just following the list of what to do and what not to do, and writing that on our hearts, and creating within us a desire to do what's right. But in spite of that, we're still walking around in flesh. Sometimes we forget that we have victory over the flesh, and we allow that flesh to do some talking, and we get into trouble because we listen to the wrong voices. The things that cause us problems are human problems. They're certainly not God's problems. We're His problems. (laughs) There are lots of spirits that we can't see, and not all of them are holy. Some of them show up in church. Spirit of division, spirit of pride, spirit of criticism has to be the number one cause for church splits. It's a critical spirit. That's like armchair quarterbacks. Right? I can't believe that guy ran that ball like that. Yeah, I see you get out there in the field. Or they'll look at somebody else in the church and they'll form these opinions. The Bible calls that being judgmental. Coming to a conclusion when you don't know the whole story. And a spirit of self, and we're all subject to this, aren't we? We we like people to say nice things about us. And that's not bad. I guess everybody likes to have friends, right? Right. But when it turns into self-glorification... Or self-righteousness. That's the righteousness that is like filthy rags. Self-righteousness. But as believers in Christ, we get to wear the righteousness of Christ. And that righteousness isn't filthy. (laughs) That righteousness is pure. And then we got into problems where we can be self-serving. It's the animalistic part of us that looks out for number one. and, And Without the Holy Spirit's influence, the number one is us. So, redeemed or not, we still have the potential to live by the flesh. Romans 8 deals with this a lot. It it really points out the difference between flesh and spirit. Verses 5 and 6 of Romans 8 says, Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. We talk a lot about sowing and reaping. A lot of times people have taken that and made it at all financial, and and you've, you've heard the excesses, right? Where it's all about money. But here we're talking about 
what we sow, if we sow into the flesh, we're going we're gonna to reap something that's not that pretty. But if we sow into the Spirit, then we're going to reap good things. Why? Because when you were born again, your spirit is what got saved. And sometimes our body and our mind takes a while to catch up to what God's done to the person way deep down inside. Later in chapter 8 of Romans, it's not the text for today. This is just a little prequel, a little extra, no charge for this. Paul writes later on in chapter 8 that we're, we who are, who are redeemed by Christ have the authority to put to death the works of the flesh. And I don't know about you, but I, I think that's a daily thing. Now, now we don't have to live uh, afraid. We, we don't have to live in fear. Like, oh, no, I hope I don't mess up today. I hope I don't mess up today. We, we can take authority over the flesh. We have the authority in Christ Jesus to put to death the works of the flesh. We don't need anybody to do it for us. You don't even need anyone to pray over you that you can do that. If you're a child of God, you have the authority to put to death the works of the flesh. Think about it. It's the one thing you have absolute control over. Nobody can tell you not to. Huh? You're accountable only to God. So a lot of the things that we deal with that are works of the flesh, I'm not saying it's always easy, but I am saying that you as a child of God have the authority to say no. I will not. I take authority over this in Jesus' name. It's not a hopeless situation. (laughs) Christ died to set us free. But listen, we have memories about lousy things. And sometimes those memories come back. We have to let the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, that indwells all true believers in and followers of Jesus to have the final say. And as we grow and as we mature in Christ, we have to think less about this. That's the sanctified life. That's the way we're supposed to live. It's always onward and upward. We're not earning our salvation, but we are becoming more and more like Jesus. Why? Because we've learned how to put to death the works of the flesh. And so the things that bothered us yesterday are not going to be a struggle today because we've seen how God has overcome these things in our lives because of what he did. And and it's finished work. The finished work, one of the songs we sang this morning, mentioned the finished work. That was done on Calvary. Everything that we need today was taken care of on Calvary. Amen. Right? That's true. Do we need Jesus to go on the cross and die again so that we can have freedom? No. no. Oh, God, if you would just... He did. Right. Amen. Finished work. It's us walking into it. Now I'm getting off track. <laughs> Having victory over the flesh is the way that we're designed to live. Yes. So, meanwhile, back at the meeting house, talking about how we do church. And, and you can see that, that graphic up there, all the different branches, you know what. And, and I've been to all of those kind of churches, and I've ministered in most of them uh, over the past 40 years. And uh, you know when it comes right down to it, aside from the way they do things, with some exceptions, there's some, especially in our last 20 years, there have been some that have really gone way off of, of the biblical authority. But historically, by and large, aside from the liturgy, there isn't a whole lot of difference. Now, it doesn't mean we should not be on guard against false teaching, and it's going to show itself. And, and in these days, my goodness, there's a church for anything. You want to be validated, you'll find a church that will validate you. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those who are seeking to follow Jesus. Sometimes we can get very critical. Sometimes we can get very self-righteous. Um, and I'll even go the details. You, you've heard it. You've participated in it, and so have I. The Bible, though, it doesn't have a lot to say about our order of worship and how we do this thing and how we administrate the local church. It does have a lot to say about the inward uh, things that go on inside of us and how those inward choices, decisions, uh, 
fruits, fruits can be good or bad, affect what we do on the outside. And the reason I say all this, I told you all this to tell you another story, and that is this. We're coming to a series that we're going to focus on 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. 12, 13, and 14. Those of us who are of the Pentecostal persuasion, we, we do a lot of sermons from 12 and 14. It talks about the manifestation gifts of the Holy Spirit, which I firmly believe are still available and in operation today. And we see that here from time to time. Uh, I don't believe anything has changed. There's nothing in the Bible that says they have ceased, right? But sometimes we miss taking this as a whole package. And I think sometimes people are afraid to ask questions when they're in a, quote, Pentecostal church. Which, by the way, can you imagine... <laughs> Can you imagine walking in the first century with the apostles and them saying, what kind of church do you go to? And we'd say, a Pentecostal church. And they'd say, yeah. <laughs> I know that, but what kind of church do you go to? Is there any other kind? The church was birthed at Pentecost. It was normative that people who came to Christ would be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and would evidence these manifestations of the Holy Spirit. It was normative. Yeah. The last couple thousand years has put that into a category which God never intended. So, in order to really fully look at 12 and 14, I think we need to focus on 13. Yeah. Because this goes to the motivation. This goes to the heart of everything that we do. But let me start off with this. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. This is the beginning of Paul's address to the Corinthians about this issue of spiritual gifts. And the New American Standard renders it this way. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Now those brackets around gifts are mine. I added those for a reason. Because... The word gifts doesn't appear. It's not, it's, it's, it's added in for readability. But actually, it would be more literally now concerning spirituals. I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be ignorant, I think King James says. We don't like that word anymore, but it just means I, I don't want you to uh, not have all the information on this. Man, does the church need all the information on stuff like this? Uh, you, have you ever had arguments? Have you, Brother Dan, you have, I have. I've had phone calls since I came here from people who wouldn't identify themselves uh, just saying how wrong I was. Just stuff like, just fighting. Oh, awful stuff. So Paul writes this so that there would not be all the dissension and all of the, some of it not even scriptural on our side saying things about gifts that aren't true. Like, I have the gift of. You do not have the gift of. God has used you in the gift of, right? Little things like that. And sometimes they, they cause it causes friction. Concerning spirituals, I do not want you to be unaware. Pneumatikos is the Greek word that's, that's rendered spiritual gifts. Pneuma is uh, air, the Holy Spirit. Pneuma, that, that's, that's the word that's used in the, in the Greek, in the New Testament, original language, to describe the Holy Spirit. We think of pneuma, we think of air, we think of wind, right? You can't see it. Uh, pneumatic tools are air tools. They operate on air pressure. You can't see the air pressure, but you can see the result of what happens when you fire up an impact wrench with, you know, 80 pounds of P 80 PSI. It, you can see what happens, right? The result of it. So that's where we get our word pneumatic. Pneumatic costs. What a great way to think of the, the Holy Spirit. That there's power in the Holy Spirit. That we can't always see. That means we can't live by manifestation, right? We, we see the Holy Spirit's power, first of all, by faith. If God reveals His Holy Spirit in a physical way, that's, that's what a manifestation is. Well, then that's, that's a blessing. But we approach this whole thing, first of all, by faith. And in chapter 12, we
we have the list. We always go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for the list of the manifestation gifts. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. And we sometimes can almost approach it as if Paul wrote them there saying, now here, here they are and they exist. And that's not at all the way he wrote it. He was talking about how these things happen in the life of a church when they meet together. And he brings them up to give correction where it's needed and to give encouragement where it's needed. He does not write, here they are, get out your notebook because here are the lists. I don't think it's an exhaustive list. I think there are more. God is God. Amen. He's in his heaven. He does what he wants. These are all manifestations, though, of the Holy Spirit. And, and God determines who and when it all happens. Yeah. Now, there are, there are, there are, I have friends uh, in other churches who would call themselves cessationists, meaning that the gifts cease to operate at the close of the New Testament. Um, I, I don't see any biblical evidence for that. It does say that someday they will cease, but that's only when the perfect has come. Has the perfect come? I don't think so. And this isn't to win a battle against people that don't believe in that at all. But it sometimes can really get harsh and there can be a, 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 a critical spirit rather than just simply discussing these things. Um, come against those of us who do operate in the gifts and uh, denouncing present day practitioners all even to the point of calling their use demonic, claiming uh, them to be of the devil. The Corinthians were a troubled church because they were young spiritually. Paul wrote to them because they were immature. But one thing that they didn't need to be encouraged in is to use the gifts because they were being used in the gifts. Which is really interesting, right? They were immature in so many ways. They were not completely sanctified. I don't know that we are until we see Jesus face to face, but they had a lot of growing to do. They were doing some things that Paul called them out on. And I like to paraphrase what Paul writes like this. What, are you stupid? Because that's basically what he had to say to a couple of things that they were doing, right? But they were being used in the gifts. They weren't immature because they were being used in the gifts. They were immature because they were not living holy lives. So the reason for the letter was not to tell them not to operate in these gifts, not at all. It was to tell them to let your moral life line up with what you're doing when you get together. And man, I think we need to hear that today. Can you imagine if every believer and follower of Jesus Christ who's meeting in a church building or not a church building today, if every single believer sought to have the kind of balance that Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first one, or second, depending how you look at it, if they followed his advice, and that is seek God, seek the greater gifts, seek to be used in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Know that they are available for you. And at the same time, when your feet hit the ground again, walk pure. Yeah. What an impact the church would have in our world today. And what an impact the church is having in the world today. When, when, it, when you look at people who have gotten a hold of this, and they said, I'm not just coming to Jesus so that I can join a church. I'm not just coming to Jesus so I can take communion. I'm not just saying some sinner's prayer and then going back to life as usual. I am giving everything to him, no matter what. Yeah. And no matter what it costs. Yeah. No matter what it costs. Yeah. Wow. You'd have on fire believers infectious, infecting in a good way this world in which we live. The operation 
of these manifestation gifts is not limited to what we do when we meet together, right? I mean, it, it can extend beyond these walls, but the majority of 1 Corinthians is written to address just that, what we do in church. So it's worth us taking a look at this, isn't it? it when, when, he's, when Paul is writing to them and saying, I understand that this is what's happening when you meet together. So here we have one of the few places in the New Testament that it tells us what to do and what not to do when we do this. So it's good that we take advantage of it. Paul got word of some very improper practices. The, the pagan was mixing with Christian. Sounds a little bit like today. I'll take a little bit out of here. I'm going to take some from here. And then, oh, no, I don't, I don't want that. I'll take this. Jesus loves everybody. That's right, he does. But it's been changed sometimes into Jesus loves every sin. And now he redefines it as a choice. It is a choice. But you don't expect God to bless a bad choice, right? We live in, a, in an age of pluralism. It's nothing new. It started, uh, we blame the Germans for it back in the early 1800s, but critical, uh, critical thinking as far as the critical way of interpreting the Bible, almost like looking for, for ways to disprove something. And there are people that that's pretty much what they do, is just try to find ways to disprove the Bible. Um, but in this day, in Corinth of the first century, Corinth was originally a Greek city. Uh, that was of some note. And when the Romans took over and the Roman Empire came in, uh, the Greek city Corinth was destroyed. But then the Romans realized that it was a very strategic location. So they set out in 44 BC to rebuild the city of Corinth. It's in southern Achaia, which is Greece today, southern Greece. There still is a city of Corinth. It exists just a little bit uh, away from where the biblical city of Corinth is, the ruins exist today, some of them. That's why they're called ruins, I guess. And uh, it was a very strategic location. And when they sought to get people to go there, they weren't exactly the cream of the society crop. Uh, a lot of them were uh, prisoners. A lot of them were people with very little morals. And then they turned around and uh, because it was uh, Roman, and their, the Greek and the Roman mythology was, was such a big thing at that time. Uh, they put a temple of Aphrodite there, and Aphrodite was the goddess of love, but really more like the goddess of lust. So there were things that you could go to temple and do that would make you blush. There were temple prostitutes, that that's the reason they existed, men and women, who that's the reason that was part of the worship of this deity of Aphrodite. So you have temple feasts where they, they have animals that they sacrifice to Aphrodite, and now they're eating the meat of these sacrificed animals, and the whole town was invited, including the Christians, and, and they were starting to think, what? How far can we go? Where, when are we denying Christ? And there was all kinds of confusion. So a, a very pagan, rich society, a, a society where people who were trying to live pure lives were looked down upon, a society where you had also some Jews uh, who had not converted to Christianity, who the idea of even being anywhere near a place where they ate meat sacrificed to idols, that they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. And that creates some problems with, with Jewish Christians, which you can read uh, the rest of 1 Corinthians. For our purposes here, we're just going 12 to 14. But all of these things are going on. Sexual sin of every kind. All of these influences have to affect the church, Right? Well, that's exactly what happened. And Paul is addressing a lot of these things in this letter. The spiritual gifts and their operation was included in 1 Corinthians 12, not to prove their existence, but to correct some improper applications and motivation. If there's anything 1 Corinthians should tell us today, it's that it's possible to manifest these gifts and yet walk in flesh. 
I don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. You're thinking, how can that be? I don't know. But 1 Corinthians proves that. And, and it's no different today. You can manifest gifts of the Holy Spirit and still get into flesh. We talked about that at the very beginning. That's why I took time in Romans 8. That there is a battle that we are meant to be victorious in, but there still is a battle. Flesh and spirit. Instead, in many cases, instead of living mature lives and operating in, in the gifts of the Spirit, in many cases the approach to these spirituals in church is based on less than pure motives. Oh, I've seen it. Oh, I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've heard pastors tell me stories about a lady's name that's not here. Let's not take a chance. Of a sister who <laughs> every Sunday at every same time between the second and third song, every week sat in the same pew and every week could be counted upon to give a message in tongues. And one week somebody new came and they beat her to it. <laughs> she was not very happy. And yet I still love the church. I still love getting together with you all every week. I still love the potential that the church has. I still love the fact that we're going to do stupid things sometimes. And, and we're going to mess up, especially in these areas. And we have to be understanding of each other. And there are times where correction has to happen. In the case I'm telling you about, that pastor told the lady privately, I don't want you ever giving a message in tongues in public, at least for a while, to try to help her to understand that it wasn't for the glory of God, it was for the glory of her. Right. And in, in thousands of years, uh, thousands of churches, thousands of years, it only felt that way sometimes, in thousands of churches in many years, decades on the road, I've seen all that stuff, you know. But you know what? You, you don't hate the person. You don't despise uh, seeing these things happen because we're human right. and we make mistakes. And when we come together as a church, we should have a little bit of tolerance for one another. Yeah. You got to keep in mind here something. The operation of the gifts, I've said it, this is the third time I've said it. Their existence in 1 Corinthians 12 is not to make a case for their existence. This was normal. This was the way church was. This was expected. Paul didn't have to take these immature believers and say, now don't forget, there are gifts of the Holy Spirit and here's what they're like. They already knew that. It was the way they were going about it because Paul, as an overseer, was, was trying to help these people grow. And if we come together every week and just do stuff, and we never seek to grow in our relationship with Christ, why do we bother? Huh? Why do we bother? I mean, once in a while, you maybe have someone come in that isn't saved. Once in a while, they're... We're going to pray for people when they're healed. Yeah, that's all good. But if we're not growing and going forward in Christ, then why bother? So Paul was looking at this saying, I, I want to help them go further. I want to help them mature. But not once did he have to say, now, some of you think there are no gifts. There are. No, we talk about that today. But that wasn't the case here. So with that in mind, I'm going to get back to 1 Corinthians 13 again. And I, I encourage you to get your Bibles out. I didn't put the Scripture on the, on the screen. But we're going to look at this. A lot of times it's called the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm just going to read a few verses at a time. 1 Corinthians 13. Today I'm using the New King James Version. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love... I've become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and 
Though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Where do you hear this most often? Weddings. Weddings. And I guess that's okay. Although it definitely is ripped from its context. And I think maybe diminishes its effect just a little bit. I have no problem with it being read at at weddings, but I would sure like to hear it preached more when we're talking about spiritual gifts and how we do church. There was a there was a church that I was in on a a Sunday. Well, I'll just say it. It was up in Duncannon when we were up there. There's no way to tell a story without doing that. And we had Sunday night services, and they're usually pretty small. And uh, very laid back, very informal. And sometimes, you know, it's the end of the day, you get a little tired, you know how that goes. And there was a guy, I don't know his name, I never did learn his name. Melody, you might remember this. He used to come on Sunday nights. He never came any other time. And he just basically, I think, was there to prove how unspiritual we were. And every time he'd have a message in tongues, he always acted like he just moved a building. <sighs> and, and he would challenge us. Why don't you guys do this? And why don't you guys do that? And I remember thinking, why don't you just leave? And it was, it was really, and I had to guard my attitude, but the attitude of I'm coming in here just to show you how you should do things. And it was just like, oh, it was the most work I've ever done in my life. (laughs) And he had to grunt and and just make all kinds of noises. And I thought, come on, where's the love? I think we've all met Sister Bertha better than you. I think we've all met Brother Sam superior to everyone. And it's not necessarily that they're faking it when they're using the gifts in a public setting. It's just that their attitude is wrong. I like how Paul starts this passage, though I, though I, though I speak with the tongues of men and the angels, but have not love, though I speak in, in known languages and though I speak in heavenly language. Even though I do that, if I, haven't not, if I have not love, just making a bunch of noise. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, and, and, and I, I, the Bible is, is very clear that prophecy is a superior gift. It's, it's mentioned in all th- three lists. From, uh, from Ephesians and from Romans and from 1 Corinthians. So it, it's very important. But even though I have a word from God for his people, and even though I understand mysteries and knowledge, even though I may get a word of wisdom, I may get a word of knowledge, even if I do all of those things, though I do those things, even if I have a spiritual gift of faith, which is more than just saving faith, Right? It's the faith that says mountain move from here to there. That's not something that comes from your own ability. That's something that God has to show you, usually for a a distinct purpose, right? Though I have faith to move mountains, but if I have not love, I'm nothing. And if we ever think that, boy, when God partnered up with us, did he ever get a good deal? We're not designed to get the glory. The glory belongs to Him. The most common reaction to this kind of teaching is to not seek the gifts at all. Or, Or to say that whoever is being used in the gifts is just showing off. Why is it that so often in the church, rather seeking to operate biblically, people choose not to operate at all? 
If I don't understand something, I just won't go near it. If this seems too complicated for me, I'll just do nothing. (laughs) You don't get a pass. We need one another. Lone Ranger Christianity is not a thing. I'm sorry, it's not. We need one another. We need the church. And if you don't like this one, go find one you like. But I mean, the the point is, we need each other. We need the church. And when we do things like in the community, like we've been doing, where we worship together, we find out we need them too. Huh? We need one another. Why is it that rather than digging in and seeking to understand this from a biblical context, most Christians just back away and do nothing? Sometimes even out of spite. How comes they're always being used? And I'm not. They must be in it for the wrong reasons. And the heart gets hard. And we get offended. And we get disappointed. And then when God wants to do something in your life, there's resistance to it. All because rather than investigate it and learn about what it really is, we've just gone like this. Shut down. Don't talk to me about this stuff. Just do the songs. Do, take the offering. We don't do that. Take the offering. By the way, can I throw something in? Always. Okay. I don't want you to get the wrong idea that just because we don't pass a plate that we don't need the money. Amen. Amen. <laughs> can, can I be honest? Since we stopped passing the place, which I don't want to do again, the giving's gone down. Why is that? So if there's a project to buy something you can see with your eyes, you guys are great. You come. Let's buy new chairs because we hate those old metal chairs, right? <laughs> Let's do something. But how about pretending there's a project that you're not going to see with your eyes? Because... Your giving is how we go and keep doing things to reach more people. Amen. So, you'll never hear a giving series from me, but I think sometimes you got to talk about it. Right. So, we had all the money we need, it's just in your pockets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that people can fall into is complacency. If, the, if you're just like, oh, it seems like work. You mean I got to read this thing? Yeah. 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 You, mean, you mean God really wants to use me yeah. to make a difference? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How appropriate is it? Think about this. How appropriate is it that in this city, Corinth, this city known for Aphrodite, the goddess of love, was this young church that had trouble with the concept of love from God's perspective. It's all about love. Paul takes quite a bit of time, ink, and papyrus to write about love. Strategically sandwiched between 1 Corinthians 12, that gives us the list, right? And and 1 Corinthians 14, which tells us how to do the list, (laughs) we have the love chapter. Our English word love doesn't do it justice, right? Love in this case is the Greek agape, which means a God kind of love. The love you have for a a fellow believer. The love you have for another person that wants the very best for them. Think about the love of God. We talked about it earlier. The love of God that he would just go to the lengths that he went to and that he planned to from the very beginning. And that in his foreknowledge, he knew that if he gave us free will, we would not choose him. And that he loved us so much that before we repented, that before we would come to Christ, Christ died. Anticipating the day that we would accept his gift. That's the love of God. That's not a God who's vengeful. That's not a God who is keeping score. That's not a God who says, if you treat me right, then I'll love you. No, the love of God is 
far surpassing anything we can come up with. And the word describing the love of God is the love that is used in 1 Corinthians 13. The kind of love that we are to extend one to another. It doesn't matter how spiritual we think we are. If we're more interested in serving ourselves than in serving others, we've got it all wrong. Because sometimes love has to suffer. We read that starting in verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Lust is self-serving. Love is self-sacrificing. Pride is self-aggrandizing. Humility honors others. Selfishness is pessimistic. Love is optimistic. You can do it. I know you can. The opposite of what the flesh wants, right? Attention, credit, limelight, pats on the back. You know, this is, this is tough for people that stand in front of people. Because we all want to think that what we're saying is making a difference. And it's nice when I hear, amen, preach it, right? Hallelujah. It's nice to hear those things. We all need affirmed once in a while, don't we? Man, if you live for that, boy, you'd never preach anything um, that might be frowned upon, right? Listen, it's all about love. It's all about love. Verses 8 to 10, let's read that. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. I know that you've met people in a church or other Christians who kind of give off the air that they think that they are perfect and incapable of error. I understand that. Sometimes it's only our perception of that, and that would be judging, and that is wrong. But there are times that people do hold themselves up to be the end all and uh, the expert on everything. And a lot of people have met people like that, and a lot of them stay home on Sunday morning. I read somewhere, I don't even remember where it was, somebody, they didn't cite a statistic, but they, they are fully convinced that most of the people who don't come to church are people who've met somebody like that. I don't know what the statistics would be on that, but I've known a lot of people. And it doesn't make them right. I mean, they gave up too soon, right? Amen. It's, it's that old line, if you go to a restaurant don't like the food, you'll find another one. But uh, sometimes people use it as an excuse to stay in their sinful condition. I get that. But if it's all about love, if we're more concerned with others than we are with ourselves, if we don't think that just because God uses us in certain ways that are maybe more public, if, if we uh, are all wrapped up in ourselves and think we're more important because of that, we're missing the point. Yeah? There's a difference between being confident in Christ and being a show-off. You know what I mean? We have to walk in confidence. But my goodness. Start believing in your own press, you're really in trouble, right? <laughs> Manifestations of the Holy Spirit, as, as fantastic as they are, will someday cease. When? When that which is perfect has come. You know, when Jesus was on earth before he went to Calvary. Do you know that he operated in all of these gifts except for two? And the only two he didn't operate in was tongues, interpretation of tongues, because there had been no one there to interpret it. And he knows all languages, right? Right. But really, stop and think about it. He operated in every single one of these. When you read through the Gospels the next time, I want you to take notice of that. And you can find out that Jesus operated in each one of them. And the ones he didn't operate in are the ones we fight about the most. 
but we're going to spend a lot of time on tongues. I want you to have a biblical understanding of what it is. So, um, but, but until Jesus left, until the day of Pentecost, that there was no need for the disciples and the apostles to operate because Jesus was with them. And what did he say? It's, it's for your good that I go away so that I can send another comforter. And do you realize that we have a whole lot more going for us today, 2,000 years from almost from Pentecost, as the apostles did before Pentecost? We have an even more going for us than the ones who walked with Jesus in his physical body. That may be hard to really understand, but I want you to stop and think about that. We don't have to go find in Jesus. Do we? Haven't we give, been given the authority to preach, to heal, to do all of these things in Jesus' name? We don't have to go find Jesus to do all that. Not that we can do it in ourselves, but that Holy Spirit that indwells us. And that Holy Spirit that will overflow us if we let him. Man, we've got an awful lot going for us today. But when Christ comes back, when we, uh, depending on your eschatology, right, comes take the church away, tribulation, a, a millennial reign, thousand year reign, and the end of it all is that we will be with him forever. There'll be no more sin. There'll be no more uh, disappointment and no more sickness. None of that. We won't need these gifts then because perfect will have come. Amen. But until then, we need everything that he's set about to uh, equip us with. It's all about love. We know in part, we prophesy in part. I love that. In part. It's okay for there to be some mystery. It's okay to say, I don't know. Three very liberating words if you've never tried it. I don't know. Now, sometimes you can say, I don't know, but I'll find out. But, boy, they set you free. Especially if you're feeling like you're in church, I have to know all the answers. I never feel that way, right? No. But, you know, people have done it to me. Where is or what is, you know, I don't know, but let me find that for you. We don't have to know every little detail. There has to be a little bit of mystery, and that's okay. We don't have to have everything figured out and, and mastered. We don't have to identify every spiritual thing and classify it. That's why I'm not a big fan of spiritual gift surveys, because, and I guess they have their place, but it's kind of like, let somebody else fill it out. <laughs> I mean, really. Let somebody else fill it out for you because they turn into a talents survey. And there's a difference between a talent and a gift. We'll get into that in subsequent weeks. Anyway, um, we don't own them. We don't possess them. Uh, we can't put them on a shelf. Uh, we can't say, I have the gift of. We can, but we'd be wrong. We can't confuse gifts with talents. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Clear instruction here to the Corinthians, grow in Christ. And a clear instruction to the church today, grow up. Grow up in Jesus. Grow up. There's no room for gift envy in the body of Christ. There's no room for talent envy in the body of Christ. We don't always have to get our own way in the body of Christ. We need to place ourselves in positions where we are accountable to other people who are over us in authority. Those who are over someone in authority do not need to beat them up to try to prove their superiority. They ain't no one superior but Jesus. Amen. We need to grow in our accountability. That means you step out and you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to accept the more that you want me to experience. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing that when I experience the more, I'm going to be accountable to you yeah. for more. Mm -hmm. But do it anyway. Right. Do it anyway. Go ahead. Put yourselves in positions of accountability where you are going to be more accountable to God. 
because you're going to know more. If you don't know anything, you know, some people say ignorance is bliss. It's not. It's not. Trust me, I've, <laughs> I've been ignorant, ignorant in lots of things and still am. <laughs> Verse 12 says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. In the same way that God sees me now, think about this. In the same way that God sees me now, someday I will see myself the same way. In the same way I don't understand everything now, someday I'll have God's understanding of everything. Because when we see him face to face, right? Now we see in a mirror darkly, I think King James says in a glass dimly, glass darkly, I got it mixed up. But the idea of looking at, look, seeing your reflection. They didn't have really good mirrors in Paul's day. Now we have excellent mirrors. But you, even in a good mirror, you only see yourself to a degree, right? You've never seen your own face, have you? Right. You go, no, I missed it. No. <laughs> you only see your reflection. It's okay not to have all the answers all the time. But it's not okay to take a lazy approach to things of God. Verse 13, now abide faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. It's all about love. It's all about love when we come together like this and, and we, we learn more about Jesus and we worship together and, and we confide in one another and we say, I am just really going through a rough time. You know, that's liberating. You know, that's good. We don't have to keep up fronts. If you haven't gone through some tough times, talk to somebody about it. Let them pray with you. The idea is not to wallow around in self-pity. The idea is to say, I need some help. Another believer, iron sharpens iron. Let's, let's work this out together. I, I don't really, I, I don't think I understood what you said. So instead of asking you, I'm going to go talk about you to other people. As long as I say, now, I don't know this for sure, but... That's called gossip. There's no room for it in the body of Christ. It's safe to say, I believe, that the Apostle Paul loved those to whom he ministered. He loved them enough to tell them the truth, right? He loved them enough to challenge their sinful lifestyles. He loved them enough to not excuse improper behavior. A spiritually lazy person will hear this message today, and they'll decide, well, then I'm just not even going to try to seek the deeper things of God. Because that sounds easier. An immature Christian will give themselves a pass on holy living. Will give themselves a pass on unholy behaviors and attitudes and their refusal to grow in Christ. And they'll say, hey, look, I'm nice to people. I'm pretty humble, depending on what day you get me. So I guess I'm good. I'm a good person. Compared to who? Right. The, the spiritually lethargic and the self-righteous don't love God. Amen. They love what God can do for them. But they don't love God. an unwillingness to embrace everything that God has for you does not make you humble by saying, oh no, that's okay, you, you don't have to do that for me. No, it's false humility. Because a loving God says, I want you to experience everything. I want you to love that person that's unlovely. I want you to operate so far above anything you've ever dreamt possible. And I've done everything for you here. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, that's okay. I wouldn't want to appear selfish. Mm. No, that's selfish. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But let me, let me tell you something. When, when you just put yourself on purpose in uncomfortable circumstances because you know that's where God is, how many can test to the fact? Oh, yeah. That's where life gets exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he wants for all of us here today. And we do it together. Hallelujah. 
A prideful person will reject the idea that they can do something good and not get the credit they deserve. But I'm telling you, do something really, really generous for someone and go out of your way to make sure they never find out who did it. Yeah. There's freedom in that. A self-centered Christian will feel the need to tell everybody about how spiritual they are and how God has used them in supernatural ways, and they say I a lot, and unfortunately they love themselves more than they love God. They love themselves more than they love other people. It's all about love. It's about love for God. It's about love for others. And listen, I failed in every one of these, and so have you. But you know what? We seek to let God reveal these things to us. It doesn't always have to be a tally sheet. Tim won world zero. Who cares? We don't always have to prove ourselves to other people. Do we? Do we always need credit? Shouldn't we be able to come into a place like this and be ourselves? Yeah. And just be who God is, is making us and remaking us to be. That's the kind of church that everybody wants to be a part of. Yeah. You're not condoning spiritual immaturity. You're not condoning unholy living. You're not condoning uh, being governed by your flesh. But you're coming together and saying, I value you. And I value you, and you do such neat things. Let me tell you all about how. Kate, I love to watch her worship. I still remember when Kate came to our church for the first time. And she said, they don't sing like this at my church. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's never come down since. But I see so many people, and you all have different giftings. Let's celebrate that, huh? Yeah. Celebrate each other. So here's, here's, here's the call this morning. I already gave a call if you want to give your life to Jesus, but I'll give that one again. That's the first step in all of this. We can't expect to be used in supernatural ways if, if we're still holding off and have not given our lives to Jesus, right? What, what does that mean? It means I'm done trying to do it my way to find happiness and joy. I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm, I'm going to trust. How do we trust him? We, we believe what he has said in his word. We accept the promises he's gave, given, gave. He's given to us in his word. And we believe him. Yeah. And we act like we believe him, right? But beyond that, maybe, maybe this has struck some chords with you today. And maybe there are some things that you'd like to, to make right. Maybe you're holding unforgiveness. You kind of feel that if I forgive that person, I'm letting them off the hook. No, you're not. If you forgive that person, you're letting yourself off the hook. Amen. How, about, how about pride, where I, I've, always, I've always got to be known for doing a certain thing? Maybe you need to surrender that today. How about self-righteousness? Well, if these people were half as good as me, this church would really come alive. <laughs> Probably wouldn't say it in so many words, right? How about gossip? Just can't help it. I, can't, I just got to tell stories. I can't help it. Well, let God take it from you. Amen. And when someone starts it, go. Yeah. What liberty there is in saying nothing. Amen. <laughs> Judgmentalism. I know what that person's thinking. I, I know. No, you don't. All the things the world tells us is being judgmental that are wrong. What the Bible says is being judgmental is supposing to know what's in somebody else's heart. You don't know. Only God knows. What may that be? Chad, I'm going to ask if you'd come as well. What may that be? What, what is it that you want to surrender this morning as you come before God? If you could see Jesus face to face and you could put tangibility to any of these things, if you could wrap uh, self-righteousness or gossip in a box and just give it to Jesus, 
what would that look like? Would that release you anymore? When you consider what God has for you tomorrow, and if this message has done nothing else than to to, kind of whet your appetite for what he may do in and through you tomorrow, well, then it's been worth the time. Maybe you need to give him your fear. Or as Paul said at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 12, I wouldn't have you be, wouldn't have, would not have you be ignorant. I don't want to be ignorant. I want to give you this, this block that's kept me from going deeper that I don't know. I want to know. Wrap that up. Give it to Jesus.